What's up, guys? Don't forget, this episode of the podcast is brought to you by Traeger Grills. Get you a Traeger Grill. If you want to cook the best barbecue, the best steaks, the best just about everything that you want to cook that has to do with meat, get you a Traeger Grill. TraegerGrills.com. Hit your boy up. I got some coupons. 25% off. Let's go. What's up, guys? This is former UFC fighter Elliot Marshall, and you are listening to The Blueprint. I believe that there is a blueprint of how the most successful people structure their lives. They don't all do it the same. They don't all do the same things. And on this podcast, you're going to hear inspirations, motivations, and stories about how they go through their life. These stories will give you clues and tricks of exactly how you can discover your passion, find your power, and then go give your purpose to the world. Thank you so much for listening. Let's jump into this week's episode. What up? This episode of the podcast is with John Bacon. Man, John Bacon is a renowned hockey coach, now entrepreneur, uh, leading people to live great lives. And man, we, we had such an amazing talk. Uh, it, it became one of those things where at the end of the podcast, I was like, John, I would love for you to help me and, and like for us to be able to, to talk and converse and, and, and just see how you see what you're doing because I, I'm a big believer, as you know, in finding mentors, finding people that have done it before you that are a little ahead of you and copying their path. And that's kind of exactly what John was to me with his stories and everything. So um, I don't want to ruin any more of the episode. I want get, to get you guys listening to it right away. So here we go. Without further ado, John Bacon. What's going on, John? How you doing? I'm doing very well, Elliot. Great to be on your podcast. Thanks for ha- thanks for coming on, and a big weekend for you coming up, Michigan, Michigan State. I hear it's a big deal around here. Yes, <laughs> that's what they say. That's what that's what they say. You know, um, man, you you know, I my I used to hate Michigan, John. If I was going to be honest with you, oh, you're, okay? not, you're not I alone. To, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> but but I've come around a little bit because I love Charles Woodson. You know, yeah. they they Desmond Howard was an absolute G and then uh after the fab five video like because I grew up a Tar Heels fan in basketball Mm -hmm. and obviously so that then and right in that era that yeah that made but that made me hate Michigan because there was a big rivalry there too but getting a little older seeing how those kids Weber Jalen Rose Howard uh Jimmy Jim Jackson uh Jimmy John Jimmy and uh, Ray Jackson were used. I love them all now, mm-hmm. all of them. Uh, and, I, and that now makes me love Michigan with Jawan Howard now coaching Michigan's basketball team. So I've come around to your team. How about that? Well, appreciate that, of course. Uh, and I think the Fab Five reaction is, is not uncommon. I mean, look, they're 18 or 19. They had all the celebrity <clears throat> in the world. They had to go through the kitchens of hotels when they traveled because they could not go through the lobby. This, if I was 18 or 19 with that kind of fame, it would not have been a pretty scene. So, uh, so ups and downs there, of course, but they, they all grew up basically. And Jalen yeah. Howard set up his own academy, graduated from Michigan, set up his own academy, uh, and he's put a lot of money and time into it downtown Detroit. So what they've done since has been very impressive. Man, this is one of the things that, that really kills me in, in our landscape right now a little bit sometimes. Um, uh, uh, you know, and I guess we'll get a little controversial at the start. But like, for example, how someone hates LeBron James, you can dislike the man as an athlete, you know, but what he has done, how how you're like, I hate LeBron, you know, I don't cheer for LeBron. I've never, I don't think I've ever cheered for LeBron in one game, you know, in the, (laughs) in in the, in the Michael Jordan versus LeBron argument, I can't even grasp it. It's not even close to me, but to say that he's an asshole or a bad guy it's absolutely ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous he has done nothing wrong like in his marriage ever or any of this stuff he has put more kids through college than you and i both do ever <laughs> ever i mean i guess i don't know your story yet but well, you, you know good guess <laughs> okay right okay I, I thought it was a pretty safe guess but you know and it, it tends to lean especially more towards the the, the young black athlete, especially one that, you know, like you look at like Howard and, and these guys, look, they were young, you know, 
What would you do with fame at 18? Uh, I wasn't that wise to begin with at 18. I, I didn't handle what I had very well. Right. <laughs> you know, and I was not a fab fiver, but you know what you've hit on, hit upon something there, uh, Elliot, that I've talked about on the radio before. And that is the bizarre world. Now this particular case, we can expand this obviously, but, uh, yeah. the, the LeBron haters, I don't get it on several levels. One is exactly as you described. This guy's 18 multimillionaire, gigantically famous, and he hasn't had any problem with the cops, uh, hasn't had any problem with the law uh, in, any real, in any sense. Um, been married to the same woman the, the entire time, raised good kids, yeah. giving his money out constantly. <clears throat> uh, always, I think, respectable on TV and presentable and all that good stuff. I, I've not heard him say anything that is, is regretful, thank, frankly. Um, and he's handled that with great aplomb. Second thing you hit upon, so the, the general concept, I don't get it. Where's that coming from? That this guy's not an evil figure in any way, shape, or form. Not even a little bit. You can disagree not with Not even his a politics. little bit. You can disagree not even a little with his bit. politics. Go ahead. Disagree with his politics. Fine. Right. But exactly. to say he's a piece of shit is craziness. You can do, and you can disagree with Tom Brady on the same basis. Right. But, you know, but the second thing is, and I recall Rich Rodriguez saying this. It's one of my books called Three and Out when he was the Michigan football coach. He said, all these guys who say they hate me, hate me, hate me, is that they don't even know me. <laughs> and I thought, you know, you may hate his, you know, defense. You may hate this or that. You may, hate, you know, that they lost to Michigan State, whatever. But how can you hate the person if you really don't know them at all? Um, I've met Tom Brady maybe twice briefly. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what he's like. Um, and I certainly don't know what LeBron James is right. So that kind of energy, by the way, and I bet we both agree on this one. Fans will spend their energy hating somebody they don't even know. That is life is short, man. Life is short. I hate the player Tom Brady. Can't stand him. You never alone. want him. Never want him to win. <laughs> I, I I have a funny Tom Brady story. Actually, I was walking out of the T-Mobile Center. We were one of my fighters just fought, and he was walking in. And I have a rule, <clears throat> and my rule is I only take pictures with goats. Like I'm not trying to stop <laughs> every celebrity, you know, you know that that you see at these events. Tyson right. Jordan. Uh, I have one. I don't have Jordan, but I have Tyson. I have Arnold, you know, like because they come mm -hmm. to these massive events and I'm walking out of the T-Mobile Center and Tom Brady's walking in and I'm walking next to him and I'm like, man, I hate that motherfucker. Just like in my head. Right. <laughs> like, you know, in my head. And then I just get my phone out, turn towards him. I'm like, but he's the best. Yo, can I get a pick? <laughs> So like you got to recognize game, right? Yeah, yeah, man. He's, he was the, he's the best. You know, he it's not even funny. But I agree with you. What do you mean you hate them? You, you don't know them. You have no idea what they're like. And what I often <laughs> find with, I think, the best celebrities, and LeBron fits this category, uh, whatever you don't like is probably public and the best sides are private. Uh, oftentimes mm -hmm. you find the opposite where the, the phony positive side is <laughs> out there and privately the guy's a jerk. Um, that certainly happens plenty of times, but what I find happens fairly often is the party, but like, this like about him is public and the quiet stuff, the scholarships, um, the, the help given to people you don't even know about. As my mom said, and I know you agree with this one, Elliot, your character is what you do when you think no one's watching. Turn the camera off and show me what we got. And I'll believe that. It's the same thing. What, what have I heard? Uh, you are the, like talking to like manhood, for example, in this one, you are the man that your family thinks you are <laughs> you, you know that makes it real real fast doesn't it yeah <laughs> they see you at your worst you yeah, you're not gonna fool them it's it's, no. it's bacon's law of the locker room you can fool the press pretty easily the fans very easily you cannot fool the guys in the locker room they know exactly who you are so when i'm doing one of my stories or books uh talk to the guys in the locker room look with your fighters and so on hey that you know who knows that fighter you and the trainer that's who knows the mm -hmm. fighter um better than anybody so this, this leadership journey, you know, I see, you know, you have your book behind you and, and look, we've, we've been talking a lot about traits of humans and men and, and things like that. Um, what makes, you know, and, and I know you're into leadership, what makes a great leader, John? Great question. A uh, couple of points on that one. What I found is there are a lot of variables that can be there or not. Um, there are some deal breakers and that if you do these things, you will never be able to lead. <clears throat> Uh, and there's some things that everyone has to have no matter what your personality is. But I have found happily, it's a great range of personalities that can pull this off. So the first thing is to be real. Uh, know who you are, be comfortable in your own skin, and lead from that point of view. So my great mentor is Al Clark at Culver Academies. He's a Phi Beta Kappa math department chairman. 
started a program in 1976 with 12 kids who never skated before an outdoor rink and uh, he retired with 1,017 wins, the most in U.S. high school hockey history, 25 NHL draft picks from the cornfields of Indiana. This has not happened. He's the math department chairman, like I said. His big pregame speech, get ready for this one, Alex. I know you're a good speaker. He walks in and he says, well, this would be a good one to win. <laughs> it's like, wow, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so motivating. He, oh, even when I'm 22, I'm going, really, that's it? This is the, this is the legendary coach, and that's what I'm getting. <laughs> It, and it and it didn't matter. I took a lot of time with my pregame speeches. A lot of you know, John Wooden didn't. I know that. A lot of folks don't. It you know, it, it doesn't matter. It turns out what does matter is got to be the, the deal breakers, uh, being cruel to somebody, being dishonest with somebody, uh, being untrustworthy. If you hit any one of those third rails, you're probably done, and you'll never get them back. Um, I think close to that is taking credit for their success. It's not quite as bad as those things, but it's not a good idea. Uh, the things you have to have. And I, part of my speech is I boil it down. Who was your favorite uh, teacher? And I bet, Elliot, off the top of your head, you're, you're, a, you're a man of profound belief, uh, can pull this one off in five seconds. Who was your favorite teacher? I bet you still know. My favorite teacher is Wayne King. That was, he was my first teacher that ever touched me. You there know? You go. And now I have other teachers. My favorite teacher in my martial arts is my jiu-jitsu teacher, Amal, and my original karate teacher, a guy named Mike Garaguso. So these three figures, Boom, boom, boom. Shaped my life. There you go. Um, and Mr. Wayne, <laughs> says, uh, first Wayne, last King. Wayne, Wayne King. Wayne King, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what grade was Wayne King? I didn't get him until I was, it was a senior year of high school. There you go, but you got him. Uh, right. What did he, uh, did he care about you? He is one of the, <clears throat> excuse me, he extremely cared about me because he was my basketball, he was the assistant basketball coach too, uh -huh. and I played a little ball, you know, and it, 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 it shaped my life to where it went. I, I don't know if my life would have quite fit the same trajectory had I not met Wayne King. There's Wayne King. Next question. Yeah. Uh, was he easy? No, no. Ridiculously hard. There you go. Well, I've asked that question, Wayne, since, oh, I think, oh, six it was, maybe <clears> seven, <throat> in Vancouver. And I've asked it South America, North America, Sao Paulo, Santiago, Chile, English, Portuguese, Espanol. And zero out of 300 times, I mean, it could be any grade whatsoever, it could be race, gender, all that stuff. There's no commonalities whatsoever, subject, etc. cetera. Um, two commonalities always. One, they cared about me. And two, uh, zero for 300 were easy. Zero for 300. That's yeah. got to get your attention for all the variables. So if I had to boil it down, Elliot, it'd be those two things. I care about you so much. Uh, I, won't, I will not let you settle for less. You're capable of more, whether you believe it or not. Um, so those guys, the guys who change your lives, if I care about you and I don't push you, I'm a pushover and I need you in my schedule, frankly, <laughs> but you're not going to change my life. I'm not going to remember you. If, it, if you push me, but you don't care about me, you're a jerk. I'll remember you. Uh, but I'm not going to care about you or all that. Those people who change your lives are the same in those two regards. So I had to boil it down. That's leadership. The rest is details. That's so interesting how, how you got there right there. You know, how long did, how, how long? Did that take you to be, because your, your answer, like you asked me my three teachers, you know, mm -hmm. and I came up with them, you know, like that, you know, how long did it take you to figure this out? Like, okay, this is what makes a good leader. Well, let's see. I asked a question back in 07. So I was 43. I'm not, I'm not, I'm a slow learner, Elliot. That's okay. the, that's the question. And it's probably about five, 10 years after that when I piece together, okay, that's what the whole thing is. That's not, that's not for the heck of it. That's what the whole thing adds up to. And once I got that in my mind, you start spinning it out and you realize, man, the rest is details. But you got to get those two things right. Those two things are non-negotiable. Yeah, I 100%. And, and I couldn't agree more. You know, I, I couldn't agree more because, uh, and unfortunately, we, we tend to be in a space right now where some of our leaders are being soft on the, the leaders to be. And, and everyone's a leader to be is what I would say, right? Like, we don't know who, like. Well, that's another big point. And I know yeah. we both do this because it's why we both do our podcasts uh, on leadership, of course. And that is that uh, it absolutely can be taught. It can be learned. Uh, and look, some things you might bring to the table, your own personality, certain elements of charisma, etc. cetera, uh, confidence maybe. Um, but honestly, most of what I know about it, I learned from other leaders. I mean, nothing new. And you, you can't patent this stuff. So Al Clark, Dave Stringer, my high school 
humanities teacher, Mr. Puttick, my fifth grade teacher, and Mac McKenzie, my baseball coach from fifth grade. All these guys, man, they all stand me. And then like you, I read a lot and I interview people and so on. And it's fascinating, the stuff you learn. It's just great. And they'll tell you. There's this, it, this one, this drives me insane. It's, it's much like leadership. There's a, there's a, I don't know if it's a company in the jiu-jitsu space where they make a patch to put on your uniform or something that says you can't teach heart. And, and I just so disagree with that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I so disagree with that because uh, I feel I'm the, I'm the exact opposite and the same with leadership. I was, I always cared, you, mm -hmm. you know, but, but the, the particulars that you're, you're not a great leader. No one just comes out and is a great leader. There's this constant improvement in this. So if I believe that it can be taught and you believe that it can be taught, uh, how do you start to teach it? Great question. And I certainly agree that not only can leadership be taught, so can heart. Mm -hmm. maybe, not, maybe not taught as, you know, I don't know if you teach heart, but you can develop it. It can, it can be forged. And, and I've seen it happen. And you see it in your fighters. My son is, by the way, now a, uh, a budding seven-year-old uh, karate student. And uh, okay. I, I can see it growing in him. He's a, what is he? He's an orange stripe now. There you go. So watch okay. out. There we go. He's, he's coming. He's coming. Watch no your knees. Worries. Watch your knees. Your head's safe. Your knees. You might get your knees. <laughs> Those are fair game, Elliot. Uh, everything's fair game. And love and war, man. Love and war. Love, you got it man. once you're in there. Uh, yep. but you can see it growing him. And I certainly saw it growing my players that I wrote about and let them lead. Um, we didn't have a ton of heart when you're 0, 22, and 3. That was one of the issues. It turns out the hearts were always in there. You had to get them beating. You had to get them up. Uh, one of the biggest things you have to do, and this can be the hardest thing, I think, with the current generation, you have to get them to care, to actually publicly admit that they care. Uh, because it's so cool to be ironic and have an attitude and, uh, you know, be distant and aloof and eh, whatever, dude. And OK, fine. But you're never going to achieve much that way. And the scary part is in order to have that belief in yourself and others, it's scary. Uh, hope, what they say in Shawshank Redemption, hope is a scary thing. All right. If I if I blow off the paper to the last minute, you know, pull an all nighter and procrastinate. Oh, look at that. I got a B plus. Uh, I didn't try too hard. OK, fine. It's not very courageous. If you spend weeks working on it and you still get a B plus, that hurts. All right. That stinks. If you took the fight seriously uh, and you did everything right and you still lose that, that's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. All right. But it does not hurt as much as not caring. And so you have to care. And I guarantee you it's what Herb Brooks told me. The 1980 Olympic coach who beat the Soviets in 1980. Uh, Al Michaels, do you believe in miracles? The whole bit. This guy waited 20 years for this moment. It happens. And uh, when we're playing the almighty Trenton high school hockey team, 14 state titles, and I called Herb up and said, okay, Herb, they're the Soviets and we're the Americans. What do you got? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've come to the right source here, Elliot. I know that. Yes, yeah, yes, you have. <laughs> I said, okay, what do you got? And he said, Johnny, with this great Minnesota accent. He didn't give me any X's and O's, no strategy, none of that. He said, you just got to tell them this. Above all, you got to believe. He said, if you don't believe, nothing is possible. If you do believe, anything is possible. He said, take my word for it. But as I, as I say, and I know you agree with this also, all right, just because I believe does not mean it's going to happen. But I guarantee you, if you don't believe, it's not going to happen. It's like a lottery ticket. If you have a lottery ticket, I can't guarantee you're going to win the lottery. But I can absolutely guarantee you, without a lottery ticket, you have no chance to win the lottery. So faith, hope, belief, confidence, these are the lottery tickets you got to buy for yourself and for your team. And after a while, they start buying them for themselves and you get more and more and your, your odds improve with all that belief. But man, it's a great way to live, whether you win or lose. And be like Teddy Roosevelt said, one of those silent souls on the sidelines, the critics. Okay, dude, if that's, if that's your thing on Twitter, whatever else, go right ahead. You know, fair game, whatever. It's, you know, it's a big boy business. Uh, but it can't be very satisfying. That's what I have to say. So it's the guy in the ring and you are the guy in the ring and you coach the guys in the ring. That's what matters. So nor I'm, I'm actually giving a speech tomorrow. I'm, I'm doing a presentation. So I'm in a hotel right now, but normally in my office, I have the Teddy Roosevelt quote sitting over here over my right shoulder. And because it's not the critic who counts, you know, it, it's the man who is in the arena, who is, who, who takes that risk, who will either know victory or defeat. And, and you touched on so much there. First of all, I want to go back to what you were kind of saying at the beginning with, with, the, with the test or the paper. You know, uh, I have this saying with my kids, and I think it's, and it's not my saying whatsoever. I stole it, uh, as we all have stolen everything ever said, right? So <laughs> um, how you, and I think it's a very misunderstood quote. 
how you do anything is how you do everything. I love that one. Yes. And it's true. Yes. How you tie your shoes is how you write that paper. It's how you yes. raise your kids. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with results, right? It's not talking about results. It's, you know, because we get so attached to these results, you know, like, oh, I lost. So therefore I'm going to be a loser at everything. No, that is not the meaning of the quote. And it's so misinterpreted, you know, and a, a, a story, and then I'm going to let you go is, um, I love it. it was Thanksgiving, I don't know, four years ago. And the night before my neighbor had asked for some ketchup. Okay. And we gave her the ketchup. She comes back over to return the ketchup and me and my two boys are playing Monopoly. And, uh, you know, the, the one is very, is much old enough, is old enough to like really play. And the other one, I got to help him a little bit, but everyone's trying to win. Everyone's trying to win, you know, and we're serious. And she goes, what are you guys doing? And I'm like, we're playing Monopoly. She's like, it's kind of an intense Monopoly game, huh? And my oldest one, who's, he's probably eight or nine at the time, looks up at him and goes, Miss Dina? How I do anything is how I do everything. And I'm winning, you know, and she gets so, you know, Whoa. she got, he's like, he, he's like, he's saying, I'm going to try to win, you know? And she got so mad at me and we've argued about this forever, you know? And I'm like, no, I'm just teaching him that if he's going to play Monopoly, there's no point in trying to lose. And by the way, and you hit upon the key thing, you phrase it right, trying to win. It's no guarantee mm -hmm. you want to win. And if you're in any environment where you're winning every time, Need to find better competition. Mm -hmm. uh, those lo lo those losses keep being <clears throat> honest. Uh, so you're not saying you got to win all the time and all this stuff. And by the way, even the Vince Lombardi quote that uh, winning is not the only thing is it's uh, winning isn't everything is the only thing. That's been taken way out of context. He himself went to pains to correct the false impression it created. It's not that you have to win everything, or that's the whole point. It's what you put into it. He said, "Trying to win. I'm trying to win." Yes. And I mean, the whole Zen philosophy is what you focus on is what you put out to the world. You don't control what comes back. Sorry. She might, you may be a wonderful person. You may have asked the right way. She might still not go to the prom with you. I can't guarantee that. Neither can you. Sorry. You just have no idea how the results go. Look, hockey games, pucks bounce, goalies do crazy things. And so do <clears> the <throat> You control none of that. So well, chapter three, by the way, I hammered this one home. And I, well, if them I said this, Bet you agree here too. You focus on your behavior. You got to be patient with behaviors and impatient. I'm sorry, patient with results and impatient with behaviors. Behaviors I control. My team controls them. Every day you got to show up. You got to be ready to work. Work hard. Support your teammates. Those were only two rules. All right. The results, the wins, losses. We were zero twenty two and three when I took over. We we're the worst team in America. That's not going to happen overnight. We're going to play well some nights and lose. You can play poorly and win. A smart coach focuses on how did we play? How do we play the game? And if I take care of that over time, we're going to win plenty. Don't worry about it. But you can't get wrapped up. And likewise, companies, the companies that are the for-profit businesses are soulless. And when COVID hits and your numbers stink, what do you have left? You got nothing. If you're a win at all costs program and you lose, you have nothing. So your values have got to come before the victories. If your values are strong, the victories will follow. You have plenty of them. You won't get everything you want. But you'll get more than you would otherwise. Oh, that I'm going to steal yours. <clears throat> the values must come before the victories. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you mentioned it with COVID and you saw all of these people crumble, right? You saw so many people crumble and I will call crumbling. This is what I will call crumbling. I will call crumbling in the middle of March, just saying, fuck you. I'm going to stay open and do whatever I want. <laughs> to me, that was crumbling. To right. me, that was you had no backup plan, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, now, now look, if they, if, if they, you know, if they were still trying to like keep us shut down right now, then yeah, I'd, I'd be saying no. On that side, right. <laughs> right go to help. But in, in, on, on, on April 1st, none of us knew anything. That's true. None of us knew anything, right? There was no vaccine. We had no long, we had no idea what the effects were, how, you know, how it really spreads. No. Right. Uh, when we're getting out of this, when the vaccine is coming, Right. Uh, we're, we're almost entirely all of us in the dark. You're right. So I'm not talking about, and, and, and I'm not trying to say anything six, eight months, 10 months later, anything, right? I'm just saying, because you had people doing it then, right? You mm -hmm. had people doing it right away that this is nothing. Man, how do you know this is nothing? <laughs> right? You don't know this is nothing. You're taking a shot in the dark, right? Mm -hmm. And when, and, uh, and so you you don't know how to adjust. You don't know how to move. You don't know how to say, oh, okay, 
all right, how can okay. you, you just start blaming the government or blaming the or blaming Fauci or blaming and, and I'm not or Trump, even blame even even the people that were blaming Trump for whatever. And mm -hmm. I'm not a Trumper, right? If you listen to my podcast, I'm, uh, you know, so I'm not saying that. But to blame them, whoever them is, you don't know how to adjust. You don't know how to move. And now you're 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 fucking with your behaviors, right? Like you're you're off on behaviors. And that and once you screw up your behaviors, now what do you got? All right. Mm -hmm. Like I said, if you crumble, it means that the, the things that keep me going, my own, I guess, personal infrastructure, if you will. If I let that crumble, then the externals aren't going to matter because the internals are already screwed up. Mm -hmm. um, and and you said something else that, that triggers something else in me too that I, I believe is, believe with fervently. But the long story short is if you let that happen, you're pretty much screwed. Um, and internals versus externals, you control the internals, you don't control the externals. It's worth noting, by the way, when Darwin laid out his plan uh, about evolution and so on, is that what happens? Who survives? Not necessarily the strong or the fastest, the biggest, the ones who adapt. The ones who adapt are the ones who survive uh, and often thrive. I mean, frogs have been around for a long time. They figured it out. <laughs> it's, it's another it's another misnomer or, or uh, messed up quote, only the strong survive. Uh, I agree with that. Only the strong survive. You just have to define strong skillfully. That's right. It's strong mentally it's, enough to, to make the adaption. Yeah, um, it, it's strong. It's, it's not just like this outwardly, I can be very strong. Right. You know? Well, so, we both agree too. I mean, look, that was a disorienting time. <laughs> it was undeniably scary, and and you know, we were all filled with you know doubt and uncertainty. What do we do here? Uh, the first thing you do in a crisis, you don't panic. <laughs> you say, let's let's breathe deeply here. Something will present itself. Uh, there'll be a path. Yep. I just got to figure out where it is. <clears throat> look, and uh, I don't know about you, but I have a business, and my business was all in person. Um, we we are basically close enough having sex with each other, but without the intercourse <laughs> part, right? So when we, when we wrestle uh, and grapple, so I was the epitome of, of this disease. And I won't even say that I didn't panic. I went home, it, it, we, we closed our schools on Friday the 13th. Scary. That, that's when we closed, right? And I went home that night and I sat there, I had some drinks and I was like, what is gonna happen? You mm -hmm. know, I looked at my bank account I divided, I called my business partner. I said, how much do you have? We divided to see how many months we had because we knew how much our bills were. Mm -hmm. And we were like, oh shit, you know? Mm -hmm. This and, is real. And, yeah, because neither one of those numbers was small. We, we had plenty of money, but mm -hmm. it wasn't going to last very long. It's, it's scary in a black hole how fast yeah. that money goes away, man. Mm -hmm. So I took, I took the weekend mm -hmm. and then Sunday night I got my shit together. <laughs> it was like, okay, what are we going to do? We have to do stuff. And we call and the team got together. And I think the next piece of this is what makes a great leader is you have a great team, right? You have, whether that's players, whether that's other coaches or in business, probably the people that make the business happen, your team, you can't do this alone. I could not agree more, obviously. And great Warren Buffett quote, you think you're the smartest guy in the room, get a better room. Uh, weak leaders hire weak leaders and strong leaders hire strong leaders. And a great line also in the book from uh, Wrigley, the gum magnate from the 1930s. He said, if two partners in business always agree, one of them is unnecessary. So surround yourself by a good team, smart team, listen to them. If you're the, if you're the, the coach, the leader, the director, you still got to make that call. That's, that's yours. And you can't, mm -hmm. if it doesn't work, you can't blame them. Sorry, it's you. Um, but man, oh man, that is greatly reassuring in a crisis to be no, look, you and your partner, that co it's going to make or break you as, as a partnership, you're going to get stronger as partners or it's not going to work. You're going to find the cracks pretty fast. Um, but man, I think in a crisis, give me a team any day. Um, and in fact, I recall the, uh, the Bataan death march, world war two, these guys in this, you know, it's called the Bataan death march for a reason. A lot of them died. Uh, they asked him on a documentary who made it and who didn't, because that's easy. Those of us who partnered up made it. And those of us who didn't, didn't. If you're living for yourself, you your, your body breaks down. If someone else can get you your bowl of rice uh, here and there, um, you, you're going to make it. And that was the difference. Yeah. Were you always here with leadership? Like, you know, you mentioned 2007, you know, you started. What, what was, 
what was your pre 2007? Like, what were you doing? What, what uh, got you here? I was cleaning out my parents' house. They're 90 and 87. They're now in a senior home. So I was doing that over the summertime and came across, you know, your old trophies are in your, you know, childhood bedroom. Cause why would I display those? <laughs> mm-hmm. I didn't have that many to begin with. Keep in mind, Elliot. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> it's a small box. It's not that big. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them was from 1975, fifth grader, team leadership. And I was captain of both the hockey and the baseball team that year. So in that sense, it's probably always you know been something I was interested in. Um, but how I got into the leadership field, uh, Bo's Lasting Lessons with Bo Schimbeckler. Um, when Bo Schimbeckler, the old Michigan football coach, he and I sat down in 05 and spent a year and a half uh, putting down his ideas. And that book still sells very well. I'm pleased to report it's 15 years later, more than that, maybe. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, and then uh, when I gave a TED talk on this team I coached back in 2004, went from the worst team in America, literally, according to some ranking, to uh, top 3% in three years. Uh, and I didn't cut any of the guys from the previous team. So same guys, most of them. Uh, as we w- went along. So my editor, the editor for the Bose Lesson Lessons, saw the TED Talk. They said, there's a book in here. So I said, okay. So 20 years after I was coaching, I wrote the book on it. And it was cooler for that reason, Elliot, because these guys are now in their 30s. They're at my age when I coached them. Uh, and they've been around the world by now. They've, you know, most of them married with kids and so on. They knew what mattered and what didn't in a way they would not have known if I wrote the, if I'd written the book when it happened. Um, so I also got a lot of great stories I didn't know about otherwise. So being in the leadership space for me is wonderful. What's cool about it is when I talk to, you know, hospitals or university organizations or corporations and so on the way you do, um, you feel like for that hour, at least that's your team. Uh, where can we go? And what you have to do before a speech, and you know how this works, you have to find out, I I hate the cold call. You just go up and give the same speech. It's only going to work so well. Uh, you have to find out, talk to beforehand, where does the shoe pinch? What's working and what isn't? All right, let's talk about let's diagnose this first and let's, you know, what are the strengths we can build on? And then you bring that to the table and then it becomes fun, that becomes exciting. And what I find again repeatedly, what you've already found, is leadership is utterly teachable. And where do we learn it first from our parents? I mean, you're in the Monopoly game, guess what? Your boys are going to school and you're the teacher every day. So leadership is utterly teachable and it's fun to teach. I love it. It's one of my favorite things, you know, and I, I have to say for me personally, I want, I, I'm not into leading people that don't want to be, that don't want to do this with, with me. Right. Like, and, and, I I, and, and I think we have to realize that you're, that you, you're not for everyone. I'm not for everyone. Right. Like you, you there might be somebody else that is going to be a great leader for you. Mm-hmm. So go find that person, go find the people that mesh with you and your personal traits and and personalities, and then keep working on them to be better. I love that too, by the way. A friend of mine, Bert Bean, has got a great line, feed the hungry. There's no point trying to jam food on a guy's mouth who doesn't want it. <laughs> I mean, it's the old lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Mm-hmm. Uh, set it up whenever you can. Some things are mandatory, I get, in any organization. You just can't get around it. But sure. as much as you can, make things optional and see who, see who bites. And when they, when the group, first group starts biting and you get success, the second group starts realizing, well, wait a second, those guys are doing all right. So what's happening there? Yeah. Um, they're a whole lot easier to teach when they want to be taught. Uh, if you don't, it gets pretty hard. For sure. Look, make everything optional, in my opinion. Like I, I, I make as this much argument. As you can. With, I make this argument with drugs too. If you put meth in front of me right now, I still wouldn't do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's free. Like, like, no laws. Still yeah, a bad idea. Still a bad idea, you know? <laughs> the only place where that logic falls apart is young people, right? Because they're they're willing to, you know, they have not uh, as much experience. So I, I understand the flaw in my life. What I've learned since is impulse control, of course, is one of the issues. Yes, you know? yes, but, yes. But at our on, age, on Elliot, the, on the me- I, I'm not yeah. a kid. If I can't turn down meth, and say, well, let's see. <laughs> on the one hand, I get a great buzz. Okay, that's one thing. Yeah. On the other hand, geez, yeah. I got this cottage up north, got my wife and kid. Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> and I will lose all, I, all, all of it. <laughs> including these home, I, Yeah, if I came home today and was like, baby, I tried meth while when I was gone, she would be like, okay, great, we're divorced. Like, that, 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 would, that would be it. <laughs> okay, here's a box. <laughs> so, anyway, um, back to it. Um, I, I think that one of the one of the big things for me is that we have to balance our altruism and our narcissism 
Like people, especially in this leadership space, they go, oh, I just do it for other people. And I think that is total bullshit. I think that is total bullshit. You get something out of it. Don't you, you, no one is just this pure altruist. Mm -hmm. Oh, I do it for the world. You know, no, I think you have to realize that. Yeah, it gives you something. What is leadership? What is leading give you, John? Uh, by the way, that's a, a genius little bit right there. And I agree. And I recall Abraham, I recall I wasn't there. Abraham Lincoln was on a train. Yeah. I'm not that old. Uh, <laughs> He was on a train and someone said, you know, that he was making the same argument. Nothing is purely selfless. If I give something to somebody because they need it, I still feel good about the giving. It gives me something. In fact, studies show that your endorphins spike higher when you're the giver than when you're the recipient. Mm -hmm. um, so we know this. But anyway, um, and not only, not only that, I think you lead better when you admit there's something in it for you. Because the people you're leading, they don't want to know that you're like draining your blood on their behalf. You don't want your parents to die because of raising you. Uh, you want them to get something out of it. Obviously, you want it to be somewhat pleasurable on some level. So I think you're right about that. And when I was coaching uh, the Michigan women's club hockey team, I was an assistant coach for a few years. Um, and I was head coach of this boys high school hockey team in, in Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor Huron. And uh, I learned sadly after the fact that, and I wrote an essay about this. If you Google my name and women's hockey, it'll come up. Uh, that I was always trying to get the women to play more like the men and the men to play more like the women. And broad strokes here and gross generalizations, so feel free to throw salt in these and throw them out all together and so on. But I found as a rule that the women passed, 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 and nobody shot. And the boys shot, 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 and nobody passed. <laughs> and you know what? Neither one's going to work very well here. So I, I, my joke about the women is, how many women does it take to shoot the puck? The answer is five. One to shoot the puck and four to say, it's okay to shoot the puck. <laughs> and the boys, like you're, 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 shooting, you're at the blue line. This guy's wide open in the corner, right? Wide open, right? Find that guy at a tap and goal, piece of cake, assist counts. Uh, so I was always trying to get the men to be less selfish and really the women to get more selfish. So in that sense, uh, I think your theory is exactly right. It's so interesting because there's a very similar thing with jujitsu. Women, mm -hmm. okay, so jujitsu is all about the submission, right? You're trying mm -hmm. to submit, choke the other person you know, or, or joint lock them. Women rarely, you know, it, it went, especially if they're not competitors, they never tap each other. They want to just have this nice role where you go through the positions and it's hard, but, but no one ever really loses, you know, where the guys, they don't pay attention to shit. And they're just trying to kill each other. Right. And I, it's, it's the same thing. I'm like, no, I need you to be a little more about the position, right? Like you have to hold good position first. And I need the girls like, yo, go ahead and choke her. It's going to be okay. You know, like, and sure that, you know, there's a whole host of uh, genetic personality things that are ingrained in, in, in into our genders a little bit. I do believe uh, I might mm -hmm. get in some trouble for that but whatever if you're in trouble so am i so there we go yeah, we're, we're in trouble together yeah, you know <laughs> yeah and and this is something that we have to admit you have to know back to leadership i gotta got know who i'm talking to and like and let's stay on this male female thing for experience i know that when i'm leading a girl when i'm going to to battle with 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 the female my voice has to sound different it mm -hmm. can never sound angry in any mm -hmm. way if they can't see my face if they can see my face and they can see that I'm not angry and it was just intense, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I cannot sound angry with the girls. They crumble, hmm. right? Because they think me as the leader, almost like a father-ish figure in a way, is upset. And I can't be upset because now I might, you know, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Where the guys, I don't have to worry about that so much, mm -hmm. you know? That's, so, by the way, okay. that's in this five word essay, I hit that same point that the women, I never had to, not that I did not have to yell at the women. Uh, I couldn't, it was counterproductive. Right. If you yell at one of them, you mm -hmm. probably lost her for the season. Mm -hmm. uh, she's not going to be the same way. It, it, you didn't have to, you just got to give them a look and say, this is what I want done. <laughs> They're eager to do it. Um, mm -hmm. The high school boy, as you know, and you're about to find out with your, with your kids, of course, oh, yeah. friends, is that uh, I have to yell at them in the, in the locker room. Because the inch of insulation if they're in their brains at that age before they realize that there's somebody in this room trying to communicate with me now. Yeah, yeah. it's me. I'm yelling at you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I had to do that to cut through the, the cloud sometimes. 
Um, but there is, a, I mean, again, there are stereotypes we're talking about here. There are countless exceptions no, on both sides, Lord knows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as a rule, I do find these, these ideas basically work. I think the other question I had was confidence. And this kind of gets to your narcissism versus altruism aspect. Okay. Um, the women, to my surprise, these are University of Michigan students. They're going to be doctors and lawyers, and they are now. Um, and they're, they're a good team. We're a top 10 team. So I thought confidence, any group of men, that it, it, it all took, took care of itself. No. I had to keep on pump, pumping them up individually and as a team in ways I didn't expect. Um, the boys, you know, I'm always telling them, you're better than you think you are. The boys, I was always telling them, you're not half as good as you think you are. Let's start there and work backwards. You know, kid, why am I on the third line? Because I like you. Should be on the fourth line. Don't ask twice. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're on the third line. <laughs> That's why you're on the third line. That's amazing. Um, so there's there's that aspect as well. But, but and, you know, what, and we've had we we both led people like this. Some guys need to pump up. Other guys need to bring down. And you just got to know your people. That's man. That was my very next point. You got to know who's the, who is the person in front of you. You know. Who is the human being in front of you and what is going to do it for them? You know, if Dude. you're a good leader, if you're a good coach, if you're anything, anything worth a shit, you got to know who you're dealing with. Uh, completely right. It's chapter nine in this book out of 12. I got it from Al Gallup, 96 years old, still biking every day at World War II veterans. Guy's a, he's a badass there. I can, I can swear a little bit in your show. You can do whatever uh, you want. There you go. But, uh, <laughs> His great line to me years ago when I was a student teacher, uh, he said, you cannot motivate anybody you don't know. And I think he's right. You can, maybe you can a little bit, maybe you can some, but not a lot. Um, mm -hmm. The more I know you, I got to find out where the buttons are. And like I said about, you know, we both said about yelling at women, you don't know them, that's not going to work uh, ever. So the, the boys figure out who needs the, you know, the, the tires pumped up and who needs to come down to earth. Um, yep. What are the hangups? What are the holdups? Um, and, and you know what, here's the beauty part. You can ask them and they'll probably tell you. And so it's, it's, man, what you just said was so interesting because, uh, I just like, literally, I just had to yell at one of my athletes a couple of weeks ago, we were at a tournament and, uh, she was, and she, so she was sick pre-tournament. She got sick right before, and then she cut herself or, oh, she, I'm sorry. She got a burn. And started to get infected. So she had to go on antibiotics, which can make you feel awful for physical right. competition, right? So she's feeling terrible. And I'm like, look, you don't have to do this. Like, and it's it's a huge tournament, it's a big one, you know? And she goes, No, I'm doing it. And then I was like, Okay, well, if we're doing it, we're doing it. And we're not gonna make any excuses and we'll just mm -hmm. feel like shit later, right? Mm -hmm. Well, just this is going to feel terrible. So anyway, she goes out, she does her first match and she ekes it by, like barely gets by. And not because she did anything, the other person got a penalty point. So mm -hmm. I was like, all right, I'm going to have to get her going here. You know? Mm -hmm. So we sit down and she's starting to like have this pity party. And I'm like, hey, are we going to get this? I was like, we need to get our energy back. You know, she's like, well, do you have any cocaine? I was like, no, I don't have cocaine. Here. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, not today. You? Not right. I was like, but you have time. You know, you have time. And she goes, time to take a nap. And I was like, Fuck. I was so, I was getting mad now, you know, because I'm like, this is not the mind space we need to be in. So I say something to her and then I walk off and I come back to her and I know her so well. And she hates disappointing me, hates mm -hmm. it. It's her number one fear probably. So I look at her and I say, look, I've been in this shithole town for three days and there ain't <laughs> nothing to do. I hate this town. You know, and I've, and it's Sunday night and you're competing on Sunday night. I've been waiting for you. You know, I don't care if you win or lose, but you better go fight your ass off and not waste my fucking time. And I just walked off and I just walked off and I texted another athlete that I'm close to. I'm like, well, I just said this to her. We're going to see how this goes. It's either right. going to work. It's either going to work or we're going to be in a fight. Cause I didn't mean any of it. Right. right. right? But it worked, you know? And I couldn't, the athlete that I was texting what I said, if I said that to her, she would crumble. She would crumble in a hot second. And so I couldn't say that to, to, to the other athlete, you know, but this you knew one. The athlete, you knew your athlete, you also knew the moment. You knew what she'd been mm -hmm. going through and all the rest and where things stood. And you also crucially, you didn't say she had to win. You said, you gotta, no. you gotta, you gotta drive. You gotta put yourself into it. Again, the Zen thing, we control what we put into the world. We don't control what comes back. 
Uh, but damn it, do it now. And you would never have dared that, you know, six months, a year earlier, whatever else, without knowing her well. Um, there's a time I took a guy back who failed a second drug test. And he was convinced that it was a false test. The guys on the team said he was clean, smoking pot, high school stuff, um, right. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then I had a tough decision to make. Because this guy's a third-line player. He's not going to make or break us. That's never part of my calculation. Uh, I don't care if you're, if you're, if you're all state, if you're riding the bench. These are the rules, and you know, we're all the same here. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. A great line I got from Jane Bennett, my athletic director. When in doubt, bet on the kid. And that comes from Kent Overby, one of her coaches. Um, but you can only bet on the kid, all right, if you know the kid, all right? If, if it was the first two months and you, you know, blew two drug tests, the first one was accurate, uh, then you're gone. But I knew this kid for a year and a half. Uh, he had earned my respect and my trust. All right, was he telling the truth? I can't know. All right. Am I willing to bet on him? Yes, I am. And if I if we bet wrong, we all look stupid and you're gone. Um, right. So th that's the risk I'm, I'm willing to take on your behalf, but I'm going to take it. Man, that guy's 35 years old. I went to his wedding last fall. Uh, he's doing great. He's in cybersecurity. Um, so all that stuff. But you can only do those bets. You can only yell at your athlete in that case, which breaks your own rules, breaks some of my rules too. But I break my own rules um, when it makes sense, when you know your people. That is yeah. And by the way, when I interviewed my class about this class at Michigan called Leading by Coaching, which I started three years ago, we talked about, as I said early on in this conversation, what's negotiable, what are deal killers, you know, trust and so on, um, and what has to be there. The number one quality they said that they wanted their coaches and teachers was they have to know me. That was number one. And it wasn't close. That kind of surprised me. Uh, but that's where they put it. So without that, good luck. John, I've got three more questions for you. Two, I, I kind of lied to you. I'll try to, to go you. fast then. I'll try to go quick two, on. No worries. Two, I kind of lied to you. They are the two questions that I do ask anybody, and they're the two that I, I'll ask last, you know? But the first one is, if you are a budding leader, if, if you want to be a leader right now and you're listening to this, but you're not quite there yet, what advice do you give to that person, that young leader who's trying to be more skillful? Get help. Um, when I see a new leader, whether they're 20 years old or 50 years old, um, become the leader, the, the trap is this. Now I've got to be all powerful, all knowing. I can't take suggestions. I can't look weak, um, et cetera, et cetera. That guy's going down and there won't be anyone there to catch him. There's no safety net because he's already burned all his bridges. So get help. I had Al Clark. I had Red Berenson in Michigan. I had Bo Schimmickler in Michigan. I had Herb Brooks. I had a pretty good crew. Uh, help me out there to say the least, um, but get help, get help, get help, get help. Uh, you need mentors, you need advisors, you need assistance, all that stuff. That's the biggest thing I can say right there. Second thing, be patient with yourself. You're going to screw up. Guarantee you're going to screw up. And when I'm still teaching or coaching now, I still screw up. I've never given a speech where I said afterwards, wow, I nailed it. I wouldn't change anything. Every single speech I've given, I'd say, no, no, that one. So be patient with yourself, get help, be patient with yourself. But also, third thing is, know what you want, all right? What is the vision? Not, you know, league titles, whatever else. What does it look like? What does it feel like? When this thing's working the way you want it to work, what does it look like? What does it feel like? And if you know that, then you start working backwards. You start feeling a lot. The rest is details. So get help. Be patient with yourself, but have a vision. That was get the, the I don't know which one of them is the best, but they're amazing. So, <laughs> it's so interesting. In, in my get, case, Elliot, I found them all necessary. How's that? <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. I'm, I'm just so, uh, I'm just so unskillful at shit that I need help. You know, I need help and I'm going to be, and I know I'm going to mess it up. I'm so sure that I'm going to blow this. And, and you it know what? Matter, though. But that's helpful because what I find, if you have zero error tolerance, once the, once you hit the first speed bump, you freak out. Yeah, right. in, in hockey, uh, if you got a goalie in there, the first bad goal, see how he reacts then, no matter how good well he's playing that night. One bad goal, does he lose it? And in your line of work, by the way, and I've talked to UFC guys and so on, they say, you know, they love going against undefeated people because those guys can't take a punch. <laughs> you know, Look, it's, everyone's got a plan to get popped in the nose, right? <laughs> Tyson, yeah. So my friend, my, one, of, one of the people that really has led me in my life as, as a led me in my life as a young man into this world of fighting. Um, he used to say, you aren't a fighter until you lose and then fight again. Because it's easy to be undefeated. 
Every right. time you go fight, you win. You get all the money, you get all the chicks, you get all the partying, mm-hmm. right? You get everything. How about when you get your ass kicked? Are you willing to go face all of that humiliation again? Mm-hmm. You know? And, and look, I'm going to back in that ring. Yeah, I'm going to hate on somebody for a second for, for this reason. Ronda Rousey, everyone loves Ronda Rousey, and I respect Ronda Rousey so much for what she did for women's MMA. I will say that. Mm-hmm. But I really don't like calling her a fighter. Because once she lost, she looked like she didn't know how to fight. Mm-hmm. When, she, when she she looked like like she could not fight again. She hasn't had she didn't have a fight that was close again. And it's like what? And it all went away because it was built on this facade of of winning, of going out and smashing people. And once that didn't happen, it was all gone. It was all gone. It's amazing how fast it evaporated, mm-hmm. and. I think Ali, of course, speaking of goats, he's the, the, the goat of goats. Um, I had a chance to meet him once briefly, but uh, about five minutes or so. Go see the movie. You've probably already seen it. When We Were Kings, about the rumble mm-hmm. in the jungle. Amazing. And it's, it's Ali Foreman. And Foreman is beating the hell out of the heavy bag. Great. More power to you. He's the best you know, puncher in the world at that point. What's Ali doing? Ali's doing crunches. Ali's getting ready to take seven rounds of punching. Uh, so if I had a choice between a fighter, between one can throw a punch and one who can take a punch, give me B because that guy is going to be hard to get rid of. Uh, that guy, he can linger, linger, linger and find his chance, third, fourth round, whatever it takes. That guy is scary because you can't get rid of him. So the ability to take a punch is underrated. And I'm not saying Ronda Rousey hasn't got it. Cause I mean, she's 10 times tougher than I am. You're not saying that either. Sure. No, Close. no. Uh, but where Ali impresses me the most but he, he won the crown back, I think, like three times, four times. Three, three times heavyweight champ. Yeah. Uh, three different times, you know, including jail time mm-hmm. um, over a 15 year career. I, I mean, Spink, 78, the whole bit. Um, that's a special man. The, uh, I, I believe there's two goat of goats. I believe Ali is one of them, and I believe Jordan is the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, so these, these, are, these are the two that stand way out for me. Uh, they had this undying belief in themselves. It was just so incredible. Like, like in, in the Ali case and what, what you said earlier, values before victory, Ali let it go when he was the heavyweight champ of the world. Cause he wouldn't like, so he could have made way said, more. I got more. nothing against no Viet Cong. That was the quote. Yep. Yep. And, and, he and, made and what I said on the radio more. before, you, you can agree or disagree with that. I get it. My dad's a, uh, has served, of course, and you know he resented that fact. And so I said, but he, my dad had acknowledged. Uh, you can't say he's not committed. He's not going to Canada. He's not lying about it. You know he paid a huge price, uh, as our society warrants in that case, and he paid the price. So fair enough. You you made that decision. You paid the price. Then we're even. Well, that's why he's loved by everybody, right? I think you're right. He's loved by everybody because I, I don't think almost. I would say that ninety percent, even right now. I would say seventy uh, percent disagree with his politics and religion of people in America, mm-hmm. right? But they love him. They love him because he paid his price. It's just what you said. He didn't mm-hmm. run away, right? He he didn't do whatever. He didn't draft dodge. Well, he said, "I'm going to sit right here." Colin Kaepernick again. You can agree or disagree. I've got mixed feelings myself, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I can't deny two things. One, he's not doing it for himself. He's doing it for others. And two, um, that he was committed to it. It cost him his career. Um, so again, agree or disagree, but don't doubt the commitment. Yeah. I, and I don't know Colin Kaepernick. N- neither do I. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, I, but getting back to where we started with this, uh, how would you like the man to protest? Right? So which protest do you want? Do you want people to go uh, protest in the streets? Right? Because that seems to not be acceptable. Mm-hmm. And all he did was take a knee. And I'm not saying I agree with the thing. I love America. I think I was born in the best country in the world. Mm-hmm. But how? But one of our things is we can protest. It's the first, it's, it is the first amendment for a reason. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so how would you and, like and by the way, the this whole point of protest is you're probably not going to like it. That's, yeah. That is the word protest. I am protesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm disagreeing with you now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, which one would you like? Do you want the streets or do you want a knee? 
You got you. You, you, you there's People no. People disagree have with one. you. Want you to protest in a way that they will never have to deal with it. The whole right. point of the protest is you have to deal with it. That's that's why we don't like that's it. Point. Yeah. So. so all right, last two questions here. One, I believe everyone has a unique power, some a gift that that they have inside of them, and then they go give that to the world, and then the world returns something back to them. Mm. What is your what is that thing in yours? What's your power? Mm. Wow. Um, if I have one trait that has I've relied on that it seems to be unusually developed, um, it's the ability to find, attract, and learn from mentors. Um, I think there's a powerful concept there. We've only half tapped. That's one mm -hmm. thing. Second of all, I'd say just energy. Uh, I got a ton of energy even at my age, um, and I give that energy out the world. And Bob Seger says it in one of his songs: "Every ounce of energy you try to give away." And the weird thing is when you give that energy away, it bounces back and it multiplies. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to, I mean, and any musician will tell you this on the stage. When the crowd is into it, you know, they feed off each other and you start giving back more and more. I'm sure in MMA, there's no way that's not the case. Uh, and if, if, you're, if your opponent is lame, they're not going to bring out the best in you. Sorry. I mean, Ali Frazier exists for a reason. I'm back to Ali, of course. But would Ali be who he is without Frazier? I don't think so. Uh, I think probably Ali would have told you that. So... Uh, I'd say seeking mentors and the, the giving of energy. Amazing. Last question. So, uh, and this question is meant to change what we consider what's an ROI. Nothing, nothing great about me per se. Um, we need to change that conversation. What is your ROI? So why come on the podcast? Because like, mm. um, man, uh, you, I'm, I'm not Tim Ferriss, right? I'm not, mm. uh, I'm not this massive podcast where uh, I, you're, you, you might get a book sale, right? And then after Amazon takes its its fifty percent cut, like <laughs> I think that's like seven. I have a book too, right? It's like I know seven you do. Bucks. It's doing yeah, pretty it's well, like but seven, you know exactly what I know. Yeah, it's like seven <laughs> bucks, right? Like you, you're you're negative on that book is pretty much what I know um, from from my book anyway. Oh yeah. Um, you know, so why come on here and do this podcast? Like, not you know, not, you you're, you will see no bump up mm -hmm. in, a, in any financial sense whatsoever social media nothing why do it well two answers one is before and the second one is during uh before you know you think okay you know the book's behind me there as i said earlier on there's this narcissistic versus the altruistic the narcissistic side is like okay there's the book i'm on you know a podcast with you of course um get the word out there get some buzz and all this other stuff for your book, your my own podcast, let them lead by begging.com, etc. Uh, blah blah blah. Um, that only goes so far, and even when you know the numbers are great, whatever else, it's, it's not that compelling a reason to do anything. Uh, I and my wife research this stuff. Um, we liked you, we liked your podcast, liked you personally. Um, and as a result, I don't know your audience per se, but I probably like your audience. And in that sense, there's gonna be a connection. That's what you said earlier, which applies here directly. There's some people who don't like my leadership style and I get that and that's no problem at all. And there are a lot of leaders out there and you need to find the one that works for you mm -hmm. um, or the coach or whatever else you're looking for. Um, but when there's a good connection there, it's, it's worth pursuing. And I leave now, we've been talking for almost an hour. I, right. maybe a little more. Uh, I leave more energized than I was before. All right. That's a good conversation to me. And to have a chance to knock these ideas around with somebody who thinks about them on a regular basis, I don't get that every day either. So in that sense, that's the fuel I get back from whatever I gave out. Um, and I and this one, I can't speak to you, by the way, but I won. Okay. <laughs> I'm walking away with more energy than I showed up with. I can say that. John, you were, you know, I'll be very honest with you here as we as we close it up. When you were talking about like find other great leaders to to help you, like when I asked you how you know, I was like, man, I, I wonder if John will talk to me more. Like that, like literally, as soon as you said that, that was the thought in my head. I was like, man, I wonder if like, he'll like, you know, you know, it, what if we chatted once a month, you know, just like, Hey, Absolutely. how you doing? Like, you know, cause literally I was like, okay, this guy, we, we are on the same wavelength. He's mm -hmm. just a little ahead of me. Oh, you know, yeah. What, that's how I saw it. You know, that, yeah. that's how I was feeling, whether true, not true, doesn't matter. I was like, I got to talk to him more. So, mm -hmm. uh, man, uh, you, uh, I'm glad you thought you won, but. I don't think so. Um, and, and, and we'll we'll argue hey, about this at a later date. Look, <laughs> you're married. I'm married. A good marriage. Both parties think they have the better deal. That's yeah. a good marriage. <laughs> and I've you know I've never read 
you know, ev- you know, everyone loves Trump's book, The Art of the Deal. I- I've never read it. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know what it says. But to me, it's exactly that. If both sides come away feeling like they won a little bit, now we've got a good deal. Because now we'll come back and make another one. Exactly. Right? And now, now we'll do another one. We're yeah. multiplying. I don't have to crush you. Right. Uh, when, it's, when it's zero sum, when it's zero sum, you, you can't sustain it. Right. Uh, I can't. There are those who can, but I'm not one of them. And I'm not saying you need to lose. Like, mm-hmm. I, I also, like, I'm not going to, you know, take it up the rear end either. Right. Like, I'm not taking <laughs> it up the ass, you know, <laughs> but I can't, I don't have to, I don't have to make you take it, you know, right. so that, that's pretty. It's also, yeah. it just gives you a bad vibration if I make it that 60s corny and so on. If you yeah. took advantage of somebody, uh, I don't know what the appeal is short or long term. You know, short term, I get it. You still got a stereo. Okay, you got a stereo. Mm-hmm. Um, but how, how good do you feel about that? You know, where's the, where's the extra? It's, it's not there. So. And as we end here, I want to say we probably both know these things the most from doing it wrong. Right? <laughs> I, I've lost before. I, I've, yeah, you know, I, 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 we've done this all wrong, right? I'm not going to say that I didn't ever steal anything. Of course, I stole something as a kid, a piece of gum, something. Right. How did that make you feel? Like, so all of these things, all these things that we've been talking about, leadership, how to do it better, you know, yada, yada. It all comes through experience of failure, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I'm sure you will agree, you're probably going to fail again, you know, hopefully not in the same way, hopefully right. not as badly as you did the last time, but you're going to. So, and then you'll learn from it. Uh, love that one, by the way. And look, what sports teach us, whether it's hockey or MMA and so on, it's not how to win, it's how to lose. Mm-hmm. It's how to lose and not give up, how to lose and not blame people, how to lose and, you know, not lose your confidence and how to lose and come back. Because sad to say, my life at least has been a lot more failure than success. And cool. back, back to our earlier point, if you can't take a punch in this world, I don't like your chances. I don't care how well you can punch. <laughs> <laughs> My wife gets mad at me when I can't do some things that I'm just not good at. And I'm like, babe, I've never claimed to be good at them. I've claimed to be good at two <laughs> things and two things only. Okay. So everything else, I'm yeah. sorry. Like, and I'm going to mess those things up, the things that I'm good at. So the stuff I'm not good at, babe, oh my God, I'm so, no I'm chance. so sorry. No chance. But, I, but I never said I could do it. <laughs> so, Clint Eastwood anyway. said it. A man's got no limitations. <laughs> if if Josh, life is telling nothing else, come tell, tell everyone where they can get your book, reach out to sure. you, find you socially, all that stuff. Sounds great. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and so on. Twitter's my main thing, John U. Bacon on Twitter. Uh, Let them lead by bacon.com. You can see my TED talk about that book. You can check my podcast on which Elliot likes it or not. It's going to be on my podcast before too Let's long. Do here. It. I love uh, it. Be a lot of fun, obviously. Um, and this time I'm asking the questions. So let them lead by bacon.com. That's the thing. Speaking of information, all the other stuff's on there as well. Sounds great. Guys, as always, don't try to go out and be John in the world. Don't go out and try to be me. We all have our unique gift. John has his, I have mine. Go out in the world, everyone, and find your own power. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode. I hope you found something useful that you can take and implement into your life. Don't forget to head over to wherever you are listening to this podcast and leave a review. That would be greatly appreciated. Also, go follow me on social media at firemarshal205 on Instagram. Leave a comment, anything that you would like there. And as always, if you think this would be useful for somebody else that you know for their life, send it their way. That would be greatly appreciated. That's it for this episode, guys. I hope you all have a great day and you go step into that power so that you can give your purpose to the world.